Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What's the highest praise? What's the highest praise? Hallelujah. You may be seated in the house of God. Thank you, choir, for that rendition. It's an honor and a privilege to stand here before you this morning, seeing your beautiful faces, all these beautiful smiles. I bring you greetings from the Bronx Church of God Seventh Day. And it's an honor to be a part of the Bethany Nation. This is probably the, one of the greatest churches on this side of heaven. Do you agree? Amen. And of course, to your pastor, the esteemed, the illustrious Reverend Dr. Dolphus C. Lacey, I said to myself, why would he leave me here by myself to preach to these great people? And the Lord said, listen, he trusts you. And so as your gift makes room for you, this is an opportunity, this is a gift I would say from pastor to me. And so you can't see my knees shaking, but they are shaking. But I pray that you will preach with me as I bring forth the word of the Lord, the unadulterated word of the Lord. Is that all right? Yeah. Reverend, thank you for the introduction. He made mention of my family. You see them more than you see me, actually. And uh, he is so right about when I come, I'm normally sitting down watching them minister in the house of the Lord. And that's my wife, Reverend Gertie Gordon, please stand. And my two beautiful girls, Renee and Carla, please stand. Yeah. Yeah. Every chance I get, I try to show them off. So please stand one more time, one more time, one more time. No, no, please stand one more time. That's my family. That's what I prayed for. And that's what God gave me. It's an honor to stand here before you on Father's Day. I need you to put your hands together for all our fathers. We only get one day out of the year. You can do better than that. And now, I need you to put your hands together for the real father, the Lord that we serve. Oh, no, no, you can do better than that. It's the reason why we come into the house of God. We come to give him praise. Let's salute our Father in heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because he is worthy of all our praise. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I promise you I won't be long. Three hours and we should be out of here. Amen. The more you say amen is the more I shave off 10 minutes. Can I get an amen? amen? Oh, okay. I just want to make sure you're with me. Amen. amen. If you can, turn your Bibles with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 22. And I'm going to read in your hearing one verse, and that's verse number 11. And I'm going to add verse 12 to that 11. Are you ready, Bethany? And it reads, now, my son, may the Lord be with you so that you may be successful and build the house of the Lord your God, just as he has spoken concerning you. Only may the Lord give you wisdom and understanding and give you charge over Israel so that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. Remain standing as I pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment. I pray right now, Lord, that you would hide me behind that old rugged cross. That old rugged cross that you died that we might live. And that, you, that the people will see you and not me and that they will hear you and not me. I pray that this word will touch the heart of your people and that they will leave refreshed. That they will leave blessed and they will leave knowing that you are the true and living God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 
sermon topic for today is a father's letter to his son. Can you say that with me? A father's letter to his son. Before I get into it, I just want to say it's amazing how Mother's Day, you can't find a reservation nowhere. Fourth of July, you can't find a hot dog nowhere. Thanksgiving, you can't find that box of stuffing nowhere. She know what I'm talking about. Christmas come, you cannot find a toy or a gift bag nowhere. But for some reason, come Father's Day, you can find anything you need and want. You can walk into any store, any restaurant, they will seat you instantly. Isn't that amazing? We need to do better. I think we need to do better. But on this beautiful Sunday morning, we gather to worship our great God. But we also want to celebrate our fathers. It's a time that we have to reflect on the important role that our fathers and father figures in our lives and communities have given back to us. You see, fathers hold a unique position and influence. Love that shapes our lives in profound ways. You see, the influence of a father goes far beyond providing for his family. You see, our father's DNA, his characteristics can be found in our personalities. The way we view politics, how we conduct business, how we love how we interact with each other as some inter interconnection or some type of influence. You can see our Father in each and every one of us. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. You see, fathers are often seen as the pillar of strength, the provider, the protector of their families. They work hard to provide for their loved ones, sacrificing their own needs for the well-being of their children and wife. You see, this selfless act of love mirrors the unconditional love that God has for each and every one of us. His children sending his only begotten son to die on that old rugged cross that we might have a chance to eternal life. Somebody ought to give God some praise for love. You see, church, just as God demonstrated his love for us through guidance, protection, provision, Fathers also are called to do the same thing for their families. They are tasked with the instilling values, teaching important life lessons, and being a source of support and encouragement for their children. You see, in the text that we just read, found in 1 Chronicles 22, 11, Now, my son, the Lord be with you, and may you have success and build the house of the Lord your God. As he said, you would. May the Lord give you direction and understanding when he puts you in command over Israel so that you may keep the laws of the Lord your God. You see, David has given Solomon his blessing and ongoing instructions. Yes, this was not the first time that David instructed Solomon how to be a son how to be a man, how to be a leader. This was an ongoing process. This was an ongoing between a father and son. Beloved, fatherhood doesn't begin when they leave the house to go to college. Beloved, fatherhood doesn't, doesn't, doesn't begin when they are born. It doesn't begin when a child is born. It begins with you. And I'm going to share with you why I say it begins with you, the father. My father grew up in the hills of Manchester, Jamaica. And he would tell us, and he still tells us, 
And he still tells us, and sometimes I say, okay, Dad, I know the story. But he tells us to remind us, and he's letting us know the importance of knowing the power of God. When he would be out in the fields, plowing the fields with my grandfather, and my grandfather was a farmer in Jamaica, he said he would sneak away and take time out and go in behind a tree and he would pray. And in his prayer, he would pray for his family. Mind you, he wasn't married. He didn't have a wife yet. But he would, as a young man, go off and pray and ask God's blessing on his future. He would go and ask God to bless his unborn children and their children and their children. And so I stand here in this pulpit because of the prayers of my father. I stand here to say, after 50 years of marriage, eight children that are all saved and serving in the house of God, all have college degrees, all surpass what the statistics want us to believe. Matter of fact, we grew up in the South Bronx where they said nothing, I say nothing, could come out of the South Bronx. And I stand here before you today not boasting, but it's the grace of God that I can put on this year robe and say, thus saith the Lord. Because somebody prayed for me. Somebody prayed for me. I know we always say, grandmother prayed. My grandfather prayed. It was my father who prayed. Hallelujah. You see, Bethany, prayer is the key. We, money, is, money is good. But prayer is the key that unlocks doors. It was the, the prayers of my father that got us this far. You see, I know, man, some of us, you know, we, 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 I'm a manly man. I don't cry. I'm a big, strong man. But don't let the Holy Spirit take you. Because you'll be the first one on your knees crying. It's just something about when you have that interaction with the Spirit of God and you allow God to use you. You end up like David dancing until your clothes fall off in the house of God. Does somebody follow? Are you following me today? The power of prayer is important. As men, sometimes we feel we can't talk. We don't have someone to talk to. He's right there. He is right there waiting for you to say, Father, I'm feeling down. Father, I don't know what to do. Father, I don't know which way to go. Father, the bills are piling up. Father, my wife is sick. My kids are sick. Father, I don't know where to go. What's the next move? Father, I need your help. And I guarantee you, I, didn't live, I, didn't, I haven't lived as long as you, but I can tell you, if you trust God long enough, he will come through and answer your prayers. He is a prayer answering God. And so, gentlemen, fathers, when you're feeling down, just pray. When you're feeling alone, just pray. When you're feeling down and out, just pray. When those kids drive you crazy, just pray. When the what? Just pray. Because God hears and answers prayer. You see, we already know how this country is set up. We know. We know as fathers that we have to instruct our kids just a little bit more than the average person. Especially because we are African Americans. Especially because they are afraid of African Americans. They are afraid of who we really are and our potential, which is why they fight us so much. You think, you think we haven't fought enough? They have tried every trick in the book. Slavery couldn't stop us. Jim Crow couldn't stop us. Having the wealth disparities which they caused could not stop us. Do y'all remember Wall Street? How many of you remember Wall Street? The black Wall Street. The real Wall Street. You see, they try to erase history. 
They're trying to erase it so, so that the truth doesn't come out. But we serve a God that no matter what, the truth shall come out and the truth shall set us free. You see, beloved, as fathers, we have to share and carry on our legacy and share the history. We have to take time out and be with our children, spend time with our children. It is crucial to their survival, but not only their survival, it's crucial to the survival of the next generation. My grandfather prayed that I would be blessed. So I have to pray that my children's children will be blessed. I have to pray now for the 12 and 9-year-old husbands and children. I'm not waiting until they come home and say, Daddy, this is so-and-so. Oh, no. I'm already praying that their future is set in God's hands. And that is the role of a father. Are you with me, church? That is the role of a father, to instill godly wisdom in a child. Being a father is more than just sharing blood. Being a father is more than just having a title. It's investing in your child. It's investing and letting them know how important it is to be African American. How important it is to be, most importantly, a child of God. Being a father is knowing your child needs and knowing when to chastise, knowing when to love, knowing when to encourage, knowing when to give wisdom and allow them to grow as children. No one went to say, all right, I'm not going to watch this basketball game today. I'm not going to play golf. I'm going to actually spend time. Those moments is what shape the lives of children. It's the moments that shaped your lives while you're in the house of God today. I'm reminded of the prodigal son. He said, I don't want to be around this no more. I don't want to be in dad's house. Give me, give me whatever is mine. Give me my inheritance. Let me go about my business. Sounds familiar, right? Sound like some of us when we were younger, right? It's okay. I know in church we, we pretend that, you know, we are holier than thou. We don't have a past and we don't know what it's like to, to, to disco, right? We, we don't, we, right? We, we, just, we just woke up saved. But one or two of us can understand and sympathize and understand the plight of the prodigal son. He wanted to see what life was about. And so his father said, go ahead. Go, my son. He didn't argue with him. He gave him his riches and allowed him to squander it all. And there's a lesson learned. There's a lesson in this prodigal story. Because after the son came to his senses, in Luke chapter 15, verse 17, he said, and when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants are in my father's house? Bread enough to spare, and I perish for hunger. He had to come to his senses and say, my father was a good father. I got to get home. And the Bible says he went home, and when his father saw that he was on his way home, he prepared a party like no other. He didn't, he didn't dangle over his head that he left. He didn't remind him of his past. He didn't remind him of, the, of his sin. He didn't remind him that he, that he literally left his father and his family and forsake them to go live his own life. His father said, no, no, come home. Prepare the fattest calf. Put the ring on his finger. Get the coat and put it on him. Let, let the world know my son is back. And that's the same way how Christ treats us when we do wrong, when we err, when we sin, when we come back into his fold. He don't, he don't question, he don't ask. He just say, welcome back home. That's the God that we serve. The parable of the father and prodigal son shows that he had unconditional love. He had patience and understanding. It was a teachable lesson for both the son and his brother. Because the Bible says that his brother was angry that his father was having this big party for, for his brother that came home who squandered everything. Meanwhile, he did everything to the letter. 
Don't you know, even in church, there's always going to be that one person to hate. Instead of him celebrating that his brother came home, he's questioning his father, what about me? I did everything right, Dad. I served you. I ser- I, 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 I've done everything. I didn't squander anything. What about me? But it takes a good father to know how to handle both sides of the fence. You see, the, parent, the father said to him, son, is he not your, is he not your brother? Is he not family? You should rejoice and, and be glad that God saved your brother's life, that he can return back home. And that's the compassion that we ought to have with our children. Let them, let them grow. Life will teach you whether you want to or not. And when they come home, embrace them with open arms. You see, by reflecting on the father's influence of the parable of the prodigal son, individuals can understand the significant impact that fathers can have on their children and how they live. However, we also acknowledge that not everyone has had father figures in their lives. Some have experienced absence fathers, fathers who have neglected them, fathers who have hurt them. In those instances, we must remember that God is the ultimate father who provides healing, who provides comfort, who provides love beyond measure. For that alone, we ought to give God some praise because he is the ultimate father. Somebody say amen. Amen. You see, we live in a world filled with complications, complexities, and temptations. It's often easy to lose sight of our values and stray from the path of righteousness. I'm reminded of the lyrics, and I'm not dating myself because this song is older than me. However, some of you might know this song. Papa was a rolling stone. Wherever he laid his hat, some of y'all got my notes. And when he died, all he left us was alone. All he did was leave us with nothing. Papa was a rolling stone. But we thank God that he has never left his children alone. God will always send help. He will always send help in the absence of earthly and biological fathers. God provides us with so many father figures He will send uncle so-and-so. He will send coach so-and-so. He will send brother so-and-so to stand in the gap and provide great examples of what it means to be a man and to be a father. You see, on this Father's Day, let us honor and appreciate not just our biological fathers, but all father figures who have played a significant role in our lives. Let us thank them for their love, their guidance, their sacrifice. Let us also remember to extend grace and forgiveness where needed and recognize that fathers, like all of us, are imperfect. Imperfect beings in need of God's grace. Are you grateful for God's grace and mercy this morning? Are you grateful for God's grace and mercy this morning? You see, David, back to David, David was a man after God's own heart. Actually, the Bible said he was the apple of God's eye. And David knew it. David was the type of person that, as a parent, you say, don't put your hand in the fire. But because he knew God always had his back, he was going, knowing that God would always restore him. But my Bible tells me that David was a man that did some things that was not pleasing in his sight. And I'm sure David shared some of those things with Solomon. That's right, as fathers, we can't just always tell the kids the good stuff. At the appropriate times, share. Share the moments where you regret. Because that's a teaching moment. That's a moment where that son can say, you know what? I'm going to break that curse. That's right, that generational curse. I'm going to set a new tone. Share with them the struggles that you have gone through. Don't just show them the good, the glitz, and the, and, the, and, the, and the great moments. I told you, I grew up in the South Bronx. I take my girls every so often past those projects where I live. 
to remind them of where I came from and to show them that they have grass and they got swings and they live in a big old house now where daddy has come from. It's important to show our children the not so good things so that they have a balance so that when it's time for them to fly, they can fly. When it's time for them to fly, you're not running behind them trying to catch them. A good father will allow their child to fly and soar like an eagle. And so David was that man. He showed Solomon. He said, look, son, the prophet came to me. Nathan said, I can't build the house of God. I've done everything for the Lord. I've killed. I've, I've slaughtered. I've, I've conquered. I've done it all. But because my hands are bloody, I cannot build the house of God. But because David prayed and asked God for mercy, God honored his, his prayer. I keep telling you, men, the secret, to, the secret to success is prayer. And because David prayed and had a relationship with God, God said, you know what? You can't build the temple, but I'm going to allow your son Solomon to build the temple of God. And so we find in Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 22, verse 14, it says, now listen. This is David instructing his son. He said, now listen. Be with great trouble. With great trouble, sorry. I have prepared and provided for the house of the Lord. Listen to this. 100,000 talents of gold. One million talents of silver. In today's day, I don't think we will be able to count the amount of gold and silver that David prepared for the house of God. And bronze and iron beyond weighing. Say it with me. Beyond weighing. For they are great in quantity. I've also prepared and provided timber, stone. And you may add to them. Further, you have worked. You have workmen in abundance, stone cutters, stone masons, carpenters. These are all the things that David prepared for the house of God. You might say, Pastor, what does this have to do with anything? As men, we got to prepare for the future. As men, we got to prepare so that the children can build for the house of God. David was so proud that God allowed his family through his son David to build the house of God that he didn't, he didn't hold back nothing. He gave everything to make sure that the house of God was built. And so as I close, I want to use my biblical imagination. Is that all right? And I penned the letter from David to Solomon. I don't have numbers, I don't have figures. So you don't have to take out no pens or paper. But I want you to listen with me, Bethany. David to Solomon. And it reads, my beloved son Solomon, as I pen these words to you, my heart swells with a father's love and a king's pride. Just as I, David, once walked the path set before me, so too do I see in you the making of a great king, a great leader, a wise ruler, and a faithful servant of God. Solomon, my son, my dear son, heed these words of a father who has known triumphs and tribulations. Let the fear of the Lord be the guiding light of your life, for in his wisdom lies true understanding. As I pass the mantle of kingship to you, remember the lessons learned in the quiet fields and the tumultuous battles, the strength of character, the courage of convictions, and the humility to seek counsel from the Almighty God. May you, my son, like the wise Solomon of old, possess a discerning heart and a listening ear. 
For in the silence of contemplation, God's voice speaks loudest. Let justice and righteousness be the pillars of your reign. Let mercy and compassion be the foundation upon which you build your legacy. My son, my son, know that the journey ahead will be fraught with challenges and choices. But take heart, take heart, for the Lord is with you always, guiding your steps and guarding your heart. Walk in his light, follow in his ways, and your reign shall be blessed beyond measure. It's with deepest love and utmost faith in you, my son, your father, David.